Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, everybody. What's going on? Looks like we got a Welcome great show already. Wednesday. Yeah. So far, had uh, looks like third. Well, had thirty six on. Um, awesome. A lot of comments already. Thanks, everybody, for letting us know where you're from. Let me just give shout outs here. It looks like uh, looks like the uh, Orr family. That's uh, Alan uh, saying hi. Betty from Harlingen, Texas. Seth uh, from the Chattahoochee River Valley of uh, oh, who is that? Alan Jackson fame. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I tell you what, does one of us have YouTube on right now? I may, that may be me. I'm just, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Let, let us know, guys, if you hear a weird echo, and we'll see what we can do on our end. Um, I've got, got Susan Flanagan. Got Susan uh, there from the Texas coast. We got Julia from Utah. Lonnie from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, David uh, from Minneapolis. Celeste, SoCal. Robert, Vermont. Mikko from Illinois. Mike from West Virginia. As Carmen, Ontario, Ryan, Baton Rouge, Mr. P, Southern Nevada, T. Mal Malachi, Upstate New York, Gillis, Jill, that's right, Jill from Cornwall, Ontario, Canada, our buddy Keith from Joburg, uh, South Africa, Kevin Verts from the Panhandle of Florida, uh, Carol, Atlanta, Michelle, Apache Junction, Klaus, Hamburg, Germany, awesome. Noe Villanueva uh, from San Antonio, Lucas from New York. Man, this is great. Uh, West Oz, uh, Western Australia. Kathy, Memphis, Lucas, Gonzo from, uh, I don't know where Gonzo's from, from Boston. Jim from Massachusetts. Man, I tell you, good, good crowd. Um, so awesome, guys. Great to have you here. Uh, obviously, a little dual uh, Wednesday here. I happen to be in town. Uh, often don't know if I'm going to be in town till the day before. So uh, Troy has to stay flexible. Um, so anyway, glad to see everybody here. I'm going to change a few things on the screen. Uh, there's some just weird technical stuff. Uh, going to put up this. It's going to look a little bit different. Um, I'm going to get into a few housekeeping items, and then Troy's going to get into the uh, potting soil um, uh, potting soil, uh, presentation, basically how to, how to make it. Um, and, uh, I, it's one of those things, like, I, I thought this was a great topic because I, I'll be honest with you before I started vermicomposting and even after I started vermicomposting, I thought of soil as like a single thing. I didn't think of it as a, an aggregation of things. And in this case, we're really not talking about soil so much as we're talking about a potting blend, which sort of replicates a lot of the things we want with soil without actually being soil. And so, Troy's going to go into that stuff today, talk about what each of the components do, why each of these things are actually there, and then uh, and then go into how to make some of this stuff yourself at home if you want to. Now, I will get to a point that's going to seem like it's self-serving uh, because we do have um, aviator potting blend that we just launched uh, on the site, but we're also not going to hide the information in terms of, of how you can make a potting blend at home too. So um, with that, uh, while everybody keeps checking in, I'm going to go through some uh, really fun um, housekeeping items. The first one is, is that yesterday we got a, a link, a shout out from the Washington Post. Uh, this was this was really, really neat. I, I all of a sudden saw that there was some traffic on, on the site and I said, and I, I can see that something's coming from Washington Post, but I wasn't quite sure what. My wife sends me this article about uh, composting at home and I'm going to go ahead and link that in the comments right now. Um, uh, let's see here. There it goes. Uh, it's about basically how composting can be easy and then how he does it. It said the urban worm bag, he called it the urban worm farm was, was his favorite. And I was thrilled to see that. So just to give you some context, when, when the Washington post starts linking to your website, I mean, it was probably six or seven times the normal, normal, uh, traffic that we would have in a single day. Uh, we were getting, uh, we got yesterday which was just a lot of fun. It didn't necessarily translate into sales because people aren't necessarily familiar with the brand yet, maybe not familiar with vermicomposting at all. So, uh, but it was, but it was still a lot of fun. Um, all right, up next, a couple other things. There is going to be a vermiculture conference this year. Uh, it is going to be in Florence, Italy though. Um, so, this is maybe bittersweet a little bit for people who are in the U.S. that wanted to go to the North Carolina one. There probably is not going to be a North Carolina conference this year. 
Uh, Rhonda uh, is, has some acquaintances in Florence that wanted to host it there. I don't, I don't think she's ever hosted an international event. So we're going to have this event in uh, Florence, Italy. You're going to recognize some of the names of some of the speakers. Uh, Tom Hurley, who started Warm Power. Uh, Jack Chambers, who started uh, Terra Vesco or the Sonoma Valley Worm Farm. Uh, there's going to be Alfred Grand of Vermigrand, which is a big Austrian outfit. Uh, there's a few folks from the Netherlands as well. Um, if you're on the email list, uh, you're going to get some notification of, of this and when registration is, is open. It's about to be open. Um, and I'm, I can't make any promises, but I'm going to try to see what we can do to get this recorded like the last vermiculture conference with uh, online access. And I think um, I, I'm going to lobby Rhonda pretty hard, maybe to let me go ahead and handle that since it's just not one of those things that she, she probably wants to take care of. Um, so there will be, uh, it's it's going to be called the Global Vermicomposting Symposium. And uh, again, November 8th and 9th in Florence, Italy. It's, for those of you coming in, come to us from Europe, um, be great to see some of you there. Uh, we've got my European uh, urban worm bag seller. It's sold under the name Worm Bag in Europe. Um, I just told him about it and hope that he'll be there and it'd be great to see him again. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Uh, all right, next thing is today we're going to be talking about the pot, uh, potting blend or how to make potting blends and again the, the ingredients thereof. Uh, it's a, again a bit self serving, but it, it, it was also good timing considering that we've got the um, uh, got the, the the you know the planning season is is just about upon us. We just released a new blend of compost, vermicompost, coconut core, biochar, some organic sources of nitrogen, rice hull. I believe there's green sand. There's all sorts of this good stuff in there. Uh, we just released that on our website. Uh, we currently have a deal right now, and it's funny. Mark Mark uh, our fulfillment guy was yelling at me because he said we're going to lose money on this. Um, Right now, if you buy, if you put a full price of our 10 pound uh, aviator potting blend in your cart, you're going to have the opportunity to buy up to six more uh, at 50% uh, off. And then we're only doing this for a few more days. Uh, so again, if you end up coming to our site, and you put the aviator potting blend in in the cart it's gonna it, you should have a pop-up that allows you to buy up to six more at a 50 percent off rate and then we're even gonna throw in an urban worm um, thermometer with it again not terribly profitable for us but we want to get this in people's hands because we love the grow tests that we saw and um, we'll be posting those two uh, on the product page and on the website um so with that, uh, this is going to be just like normal. I'll try to get to some questions uh, while Troy is giving his presentation, whether it's about uh, whether it's about soil, which I probably won't be able to answer. Soil Troy can get those to the end at the end. But if you got any question about vermicomposting, go ahead and post them in the uh, in the comments, and I'll try to get to them if I can. If not, we'll uh, put a star on them and we'll get to to them at the end. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it back over to you, Troy. I'm going to change the stuff on the screen here real fast again. Okay. Um, and it's going to look more normal to you. Um, it's funny. Why is that not there? Uh, While he's getting that done, I was going to mention to everyone that I meant to mention it last week ahead of time. Uh, I will be in North Carolina, Mars Hill University, North Carolina this weekend at the Organic Grower School Spring Conference. Uh, it's a great conference that's got a plethora of classes from uh, herbs, cooking, uh, food justice, soils, uh, permaculture, farming, gardening, all kinds of things uh, from beginner to uh, advanced grower. So uh, if you're in the area, um, if you sign up in advance, you have to sign up before the that day, but uh, I believe you can still do it. They have a sliding scale um payment this year for the first time. So um, it's especially great for farmers who don't make a lot of money that they're able to get in at a lesser price. So with that, I will get going with the presentation here. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, Saturday and Sunday this weekend at Mars Hill University. Nice. And then let me make my screen big real quick here so I can read it better. Uh, this week, we're going to go through potting soil. Um, with that, we will get through go through the a plant what a plant needs first, um, then we'll go through the components in a potting soil or the very basic components in a potting soil. 
what is provided by each component, some extra things that you can add. And then lastly, we'll go over the ratios so that you can make your own potting soil. Uh, and then we'll do our regular Q&A at the very end there. So as far as a plant's needs, uh, when you're, and I'm using the term potting soil, but uh, this could be also considered a seed starting mix. So that's mainly kind of what I'm talking about today is a, a seed starting mix, but it could also be used as a potting soil, you know, if you're repotting house plants or something like that. So uh, as far as a plant's needs, um, it needs some type of substrate. So in nature, that would be the soil. So something with some structure and porosity to it, that's mainly gonna be our plant holder. Uh, plants obviously need water, they need air, and then they need nutrients and micronutrients. So the major nutrients are NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then lots of different micronutrients, uh, too many to list here. But, um, and then on top of that, we've, so we've got uh, substrate, water, air, nutrients, nutri micronutrients, and then we need some biology in the form of microorganisms. And those microorganisms are gonna help to make those nutrients and micronutrients available to the plant. So that's what a plant needs, and that's what it's going to help go into our components of a potting soil. So the main components in a potting soil, um, this is listed in order of quantity, um, but I'll, I will say first thing, the most important thing in any potting soil mix is going to be the compost, because um, that's going to provide a lot of uh, nutrients, minerals, microorganisms, uh, we'll be getting that in a minute, um, uh, disease fighting capabilities. Um, but as far as what's the most, uh, what's gonna be, take up the most bulk in our, in our, in our uh, potting soil, it's gonna be sifted cocoa core or peat, peat in it, some form, peat moss or something like that. Um, there are other things that you can use, but the most common things that are gonna be available to the our average grower are going to be cocoa core or peat. Um, and you want those sifted because you want those in a smaller size. You don't, you don't want some big chunks. So if you're filling, you know, if you're a farmer who's filling a seed tray that's got 96 little holes in it, you don't want a bunch of chunks that you're having to deal with when you're trying to plant seeds. So you want something that's sifted to a, a common size that's, you know, somewhat small. Uh, and then along with that, you want screened compost. So you don't want some chunky compost, but you want a good quality compost that is screened to a uh, you know, quarter inch, eighth of an inch. Uh, along with that, you want some type of amendments. So we need to be providing nutrients and minerals. So that's going to be NPK plus minerals. So uh, these are three basic ones. Uh, feather meal is the... Uh, in the organics world has the most uh, nitrogen per pound. Uh, so feather meal, you can also use other types of, you know, blood meal, um, soy meal. Uh, I'm actually next week, I'll announce that at the end, but next week we're going to get into um, organic forms of fertilizers. So we're going to be getting into more details of this so we can take up more time then. So join us next week for that. Uh, but anyway, so a, a easy, Easy mix of NPK would be feather meal, rock dust or rock, rock phosphate. And my uh, phosphate got, I think, hidden behind my picture there, the, the word phosphate. And then green sand. So those are three easy materials that can be purchased and mixed together um, that are going to provide us with uh, the NPK plus our minerals. And then the last component. So we've got four things all together. Uh, the last component is going to be either one of these things or a mix of these things. So perlite, vermiculite, or rice hulls. And we will get into the next slide of what all of these things do in a mix. So what are each of these gonna, things gonna provide? In the beginning, I said that plants you know, need substrate, they need water, they need air, they need biology, and they need nutrients. So our core, cocoa core or peat is gonna provide the substrate this is a material that is going to absorb water, but it also easily releases water. So it's kind of, um, we need something that's gonna help the plants to breathe and we need something that's gonna help to absorb moisture. The substrate's gonna be halfway in between there where it's gonna hold some moisture, but it's easily gonna release moisture as well. So that's what's good about core and peat. The compost in our mix is gonna provide that water holding capacity. So with all the humus that's in a compost, 
once you water your plants, that's going to help to keep that moisture in. That's going to help to continue to provide moisture and food to your plants. The compost is also going to provide the microorganisms or the biology that we need to make nutrients available to plants. Uh, so we've got our substrate, we've got our water holding capacity and biology, and then we need something for porosity and drainage. So this is where our perlite, vermiculite, and rice hulls come into play. So again, you could use one of those things, two of those things, or a mix of all three of those things. Um, it, that's just something that's going to be in our mix. So you don't want a seedling that's sitting in a moist environment for a long time because you can get root rot or other types of uh, pathogens or diseases. So we want something that's going to dry out. And so we need some porosity and drainage. So that's why we want to mix some of this perlite vermiculite or rice hulls in. Uh, so along with that, then we need our amendments, which I mentioned in the previous slide, which are going to provide our nutrients and micronutrients. And when I may, when I use the word amendments, I mean those rock phosphates, uh, different types of meals, feather meal, blood meal, uh, green sand, and those types of things. So that's what each one of these things does. There are also, I mentioned four basic ingredients, uh, either cocoa core or peat moss, or even again, you could do a mixture of those two. Compost is your second one. Uh, perlite, vermiculite, rice hulls. Uh, and then our fourth one was the nutrients. And then you can also add in some extra things. These are just a few that I thought of, but there's probably more that I didn't think of. Um, I put vermicompost in here. That's a great addition to uh, any type of potting soil. Um, you wanna follow that 20% rule where you're not putting more than 20% of the volume into the mix. So vermicompost is gonna provide even more biology, just like compost is gonna provide even more microorganisms along with uh, growth hormones and other beneficial things that are great to add in. Uh, some people like it to add in biochar. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details of what biochar is, but it's basically gonna be an addition of extra carbon into our mix and plants, both plants and soils need extra carbon. It's also gonna provide basically a condominium or this home that's gonna be able to provide a space for all these micro more microorganisms to uh, make a home in that compost or, or uh, sorry, potting soil uh, to benefit your plants in the future. Uh, and then mycorrhizal spores are another thing that you can add into the mix. Um, I always recommend adding them directly to roots or to seeds, but that's something that you can add into a potting soil. Uh, and another thing that some people add in is uh, insect frass. So that adds uh, chitin and a few other things that are beneficial to soils and plants. Uh, and then these pictures on the right hand side here just show um, a very close up picture of a piece of biochar and then some uh, mycorrhizal spores that are underneath the microscope there. So that's what those are. And then if you want to make your own, uh, this is our last thing we'll talk about. If you want to make your own mix at home, um, you can gather these ingredients. If you have, have a cement mixer, you know, one of those tubs that spins around those are going to be the best thing to use to really mix these things uh, evenly and get everything uh, turned around, turned up well. So either a cement mixer or most people have a wheelbarrow or even a tub like a Rubbermaid, big Rubbermaid bin or something like that. Uh, and then these are the ratios. I This is a basic recipe that I have taken from Elliot Coleman. Uh, I got to get it up in, where it's not in the glare. Elliot Coleman's Four Season Garden. Harvest, sorry, Four Season Harvest. Uh, Elliot Coleman's very well known grower for years and years. And this is his recipe. So um, three gallons of core or peat, three gallons of compost, one gallon of either one of these things, two of these things, or a mix of these things, of the perlite, vermiculite, or rice hulls, and then just one cup of equal parts of your NPK. And the again, uh, next week we will get into more details about this, so these could be other things, but um, these are easy to find and great to use, feather meal, rock dust, and green sand. So making a mixture of equal parts of those and then using one cup in this mix. And then I wanted to mention that if you're adding vermicompost, uh, I've come up with the ratios for this mix uh, so that you're staying at about 15 to 20 percent. So you for this, these ratios right here, you would want to use 
uh, one to 1.5 gallons of vermicompost, and that will give you about 20% of your mix altogether. Um, this is a very basic mix, so you can adjust these ratios. This is for a seed starting mix or a potting blend. If you're someone who does uh, blocks, so if you're a farmer who uh, makes the blocks with the little block makers, you want something that's going to hold a bit more water, so you could adjust this to add a bit more compost to it. Or depending on the climate that you're in, if you're in a wet climate, humid climate that there's already a lot of moisture around. Maybe you want something that's a bit drier. You could cut back on the compost and add a little bit more uh, core or peat. Or if you're in a dry climate, you could you know do the opposite where you're adding maybe a bit more compost and cutting back on the peat so that you're holding a bit more moisture in. And it may also depend on what types of crops you're growing. So uh, some things may want a bit drier soil or a bit wetter soil. Uh, and with that, we can start taking some questions and answers uh, regarding anything that we've talked about with potting soils or anything with worm soils, compost tea, anything like that. And I'm going to get out of this screen right here. Yeah, I'm going to start with the last one that we got first. Celeste was looking, and I think I know the answer, but she said she, she missed it. Is it one cup each of feather meal, rock dust, green sand, or equal parts adding up to one cup? Equal parts adding up to one cup. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Cool, cool. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you a question because I know with seed starting, you could technically s s start seeds in a wet paper towel because right. it really needs water. And, and they say that whatever the seed needs in order to, to, to germinate is enclosed within the seed. What is the point of having something with that's a little bit more Gucci? uh like like a seed starting mix like this what what do what do people get what do people get out of it if they're planning to transplant later is there is there something that that adds to the the health of the plant yeah well so once your seed you're correct in that you know once you're for your seed to initially sprout and put out that first root um it just needs moisture yeah i've done plenty of seeds just in a moist paper towel on a plate um so to germinate a seed, you don't really need anything, but once it germinates, you're gonna need some biology and nutrients um, to start working with the plant. Um, if you were to just sprout a seed and either let it go by itself in no substrate and you're able to keep it moist or, or even just put it in like um, cocoa core by itself, you're gonna not have a vibrant looking plant, you're going to maybe have lanky growth or really light colored. Uh, you don't have enough nitrogen, so you may have yellowish plants. Um, mm -hmm. You're just going to not have healthy plants. So just okay. like yeah. right when a baby's born, it's healthy, but soon after the baby's born, it needs some type of supplements for nutrition and things like that. So same things with the seed. Yeah. Got to feed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Alan asked, and this is a question I answered for him, but he asked what size for the screening mesh basically is compost. I, and I believe he was referring to compost. Most composts, and correct me if I'm wrong here, are going to be screened to three eighths of an inch. Is that correct? It's going to be, it's going to have plenty of coarse material that gets through there like that. So, and that's great for porosity. That's another, you know, porosity builder um, there, Alan. So did I, did I answer that one correctly, Troy? Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. Um, Brian said he's been using leaf mold as a seed starter uh, and it's been working great for him. He also said his soil mix is 40% leaf mold, 40% aged compost and 20% worm castings, which minus some of the other things like biochar and green sand and the organic nitrogen uh, is, is accomplishing a lot of what we were talking about. I would say the aged compost is more of his, maybe more of his substrate in that case. And, and the leaf mold might be acting like more of a microbially, they're both got plenty of microbes in them. Um, but, uh, it's interesting to see people, they're, they're just using really, really basic stuff to do this. Um, you know, we, we can make it more complicated, but Brian's, um, ratio looks looks good for him. The one thing I want to mention here too, specific to worm castings, Brian mentions this here. He only uses, he uses 20% worm castings. Troy, your recipe you put out there is like 10 to 15%. Anything more than 20% worm castings in a mixture is, is often going to start giving you 
diminishing, if not negative returns. If you were to start growing things in 50% worm castings, you're actually going to see worse results than if you started and then if you were growing them in 10 to 20. That's it's going to vary by crop, um, but in general, you want to keep you want to keep those worm castings down to 10 to 20 percent. I mean, there's issues with with salts, uh, with with drainage uh, as well. That worm casting just holds so much water, and you can overdo it with those. So, just interesting to bring up that both Brian and Troy's ratios were fairly similar in terms of what they were using for for worm castings. Um, Let's see here. Uh, somebody on Facebook, and I can't tell who it was, says, how does compost help prevent plant diseases? You want to get into that one, Troy? Yeah. So one of the ways is that you've got microorganisms that are in there that are going to outcompete uh, pathogens and diseases and things like that. So you've got so many good beneficials that they're acting like a security force that are keeping... Um, there's different types of things. It could be a really long answer, but um, different uh, fungi are putting out like antibiotics and things like that that are keeping these pathogens away from plants and keeping them at bay. Yeah. Um, Heather Rinaldi, she said this at, at uh, Zach Brooks at the Arizona Worm Farm had a really, really good conference beginning of last year. And it was interesting. She brought up, she was talking about staph infections and where do staph infections happen most most often? They they happen in hospitals. And and that's where people are most susceptible to them because it's such an antibiotic type of environment because the people do not have, they're often so many, it's so sterile and people are, are often on so many other antibiotics that, they, that you don't have the beneficial biotics to help fight these things off. It doesn't necessarily go out and kill these diseases. It just makes your body, it just hardens your body and in this case our plants to um, to those diseases. You just have much better defenses. Um, one of the things that worm castings does specifically with with a fungal disease called um, pythium, which is I believe damping off, uh, is is that as the as the pythium spores go out into the soil, they're looking for germinating seeds to the that they can that they can uh, infect. And one thing vermicompost does is it creates all this noise out in your uh, out in, in in your soil where the the spores are looking for the exudates that are coming off the seeds to say, "Ooh, there's a there's a seed that I can go attack." Vermicompost puts out all this stuff. If you think of it in a, I hate to use the Air Force term on a soil show, but it's like chaff and flares. You're just putting a whole bunch of stuff out there to try to fool the uh the spores the spores are still there they're still just as virulent virulent they just cannot see the germinating spores in soil that's grown in ver uh, that's been treated with vermicompost because the vermicompost is adding uh so much of that noise out there that it's it makes it stealthy so um it does there's all sorts of ways um and i i can't see the guy's name but uh that but it, it's typically not about defeating the disease it's about it's about making the plant not as susceptible to it. So anyway, we might've beaten that, that dead horse here. Um, Enduro on YouTube. And if you're, if you're not watching, if you're on YouTube and you're not subscribed, please subscribe. If you are watching us on Facebook, love it. If you went subscribed on YouTube, we just get a lot more, a uh, lot more coverage over there. Uh, but Enduro on YouTube is asking, he has a pile of leaf leaves and small sticks. That's about 10 feet by 20 feet. Could I use that as soil for my raised beds that I'm making this year? He says that he has too much morning glory in his yard to grow in the ground. So he doesn't want to grow in the ground. I would say you're going to need a lot more than leaves and sticks, but as, but the closer those leaves ha are or have become to soil, which makes them effectively more leaf mold, the better. Um, but I would be, Troy, if, we're working with limited information here, but what would you say? Somebody's got a whole big pile and, you know, big bed full of, of this decomposing material, what, what should be added to it to make it a good growing medium? Do you have any answers to that? Um, it would depend on the size, but you would want it to, just, I would agree with you that you'd want it to be closer to soil. So you could add some compost in there and maybe, um, I mean, you could do like a potting blend similar to what we're talking about to add on top of that, uh, 
and then allow this stuff to break down underneath kind of like a lasagna garden where you've got stuff underneath and then a soil layer on top expecting the stuff on the bottom to break down over time um yeah so yeah like a compost soil mix on top or something like a potting soil blend put it put right on top like a lasagna style or kind of a hugo culture type thing i would mm. i would treat it kind of like a hugo culture and and Dura, one one thing you can do, and this this may not be the best compost, but if you live somewhere where your municipality has a composting program, they would have taken last fall's uh, leaves and and sticks and yard waste um, and collected it and composted it. And you can often buy that stuff back for literally like thirty dollars a yard. And I know we can do that here delivered. You're essentially paying nothing for the compost. What you're paying for is a truck to deliver it. Um, that would be a good amendment for all that other stuff. And I think it would actually accelerate the breakdown of those leaves and sticks because that stuff's going to come to you with, with the microbes that you're going to, uh, that are going to help break all of those other materials down. So yeah, I would not recommend growing, uh, uh, in that, uh, by itself. Um, I'm going to get to something I saw. First question came in was from Kathy Bishop on YouTube. She said she's been using the urban worm bag for two years. Uh, and her, this spring will be her first time harvesting the castings. And she looks forward to a few tips. My first tip is to not wait two years before <laughs> harvesting the urban worm bag. You end up getting such compaction, um, that it makes the first harvest difficult. You could have a little bit of anaerobic kind of stinky stuff coming out of the bottom. Um, so Kathy, I would, I would, yeah, open that thing up. Um, presume you've got the old version two, uh, which has got the zipper. You may or may not, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Cause it was about two years ago when we released the latest version, which will be the version we'll have moving forward. Um, you're going to want to thump the sides of that thing and break up some of that, um, some of that material and you may have to reach up into the bottom of the urban worm bag and start pulling material out by hand because it's probably not going to flow out if it's been two years uh after you harvest close the bag back up um you don't have at least close up the uh drawstring and then take a take a blunt instrument whether it's a two by four or a small like a baseball bat or or even your own foot and just kick the sides of it which is going to help push more of that stuff down. And I would do as many harvests as you can until you start getting a whole lot of worms in there. Um, because what we want to do is start getting that, that continuous flow through actually continuously flowing through, which is where you get that nice stuff that kind of comes out and flows more, uh, easily into your hands and is a little bit less, a uh, little bit less chunky. Um, that's it for the questions that we had built uh, that we had here. Um, actually, I'm sorry. No, nope, those are the ones I had starred. Uh, we got some more here, Troy. I don't know if you've seen them come in, if you want to handle any that you see, or if I can read them to you and you want to handle them real time, that's fine too. Uh, Klaus asks, what do you think of replacing bark humus with peat moss or cocoa core? Um, I'm trying to think of any disadvantages to that. I would think it would be okay. I was going to even mention like, um, as a replacement, uh, you know, broken down when you go into the forest and you find a broken down tree and it's just like nothing but crumbly, basically humus already, um, you can use that as well. So I think that the bark, uh, bark humus should be okay. Uh, Lonnie asked, how will this mix work for soil blocks? I had mentioned that in the uh, last slide that you could adjust the ratios to have a little bit more compost in there to hold a bit more water to block things up better. Uh, okay. And then my guess is, are the ashes out of my furnace okay for biochar? Those are two different things. Um, the little black bits that are in your furnace, that are in your wood furnace, uh, may be okay to use as biochar, but the ashes are going to be um, considered, they are going to have minerals in there. So potash comes, uh, people use ash to for potash, which is also potassium, part of the NPK, that's the K in NPK. Um, so you could use a little bit in your mix to, instead of like green sand or it to mix for green sand, you don't want too much because there are also a good amount of salts in ashes and salts can have a detrimental effect to plants and organisms, microorganisms. Um, M, M asked, could you clarify what you meant by adjusting ratios for climates? Um, what I was saying was that I was 
saying that the compost is going to have the water holding capabilities. Sometimes you may not want to keep that much moisture in your plants, or sometimes maybe because of your climate, you may need to be may need to have to hold more water uh, when you're watering. So you know, if you're in the desert and you're going out to water um, flats of veggie starts, you don't want them drying out right away because of your human climate. So you might want to add a bit adjust your ratios to have a bit more compost in there to hold more water. Or if you're somewhere that it's humid, the exact opposite, you'd want to hold less water so that you're not um, just like Steve was mentioning with pythium or something like that, something that's caused by dampness on the roots. Um, Got a if, mycorrhizal one here for you. You saw that? Yeah, yeah. I was reading that next. So the question is, if mycorrhizal fungi only resides on living roots, how is it possible for companies to make such large quantities to sell? They grow them out on living roots and they use a bunch of plants to grow spores and uh, fragments of, of hyphae. Um, what's better, a handful of pure worm casting directly placed under a newly transplanted plant or a handful spread evenly in the compost around it? I'm a little confused. I, I'm guessing that means either mixed in or placed on top. Yeah, I think he's saying, do you want it basically more condensed right uh, right underneath, placed directly under a newly transplanted plant or a handful kind of basically, do you want to mix it in or have it be more uh, like concentrated? Um, my intuition tells me that you'd rather that wor the worm castings be sort of suffused around in, inside the, the soil that you're growing in. It sort of depends on what the other material is, Reggie, but I, I think if I with the information we have, I, I think that you're probably better off mixing, probably mixing it into that, that soil, that soil medium. I don't know. Do you, does that give you any more clarity, Troy, on, on um, what he's asking? I would say either way, if, if the soil's been disturbed and it's already loose, then I would mix vermicompost down there. But if it's a place where you've got an established plant where there has not been any disturbance in the soil, then just top dress and water it in and, and allow the water to push those castings down into the soil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Carmen asks, can we break the charcoal down to a very small size? And yeah, yes, you can. And uh, I think you're probably referring more to like a biochar breaking it down. Um, a lot of people when they make biochar end up crushing it into something smaller, which actually just increases the surface area even more, which is really a lot of half the benefit really of, of biochar is the immense surface area that it has. So yes, you can do that. Biochar is tricky because, and, and we should probably do one on this and maybe even have a biochar expert come come talk to us because it seems to be like for a, a worm thing, we get a lot of stuff, <laughs> we get a lot of interest in biochar. I've tried to make biochar. I've got a I've got a biochar kiln actually made by a friend of mine. It's really a neat looking thing. Um, I had trouble in many ways in, in many ways getting it to all cook relatively evenly. So I, I would get a little too hot and a little too much would actually burn and go to ash, which is what Troy was talking about before. Uh, but then there was some stuff that just didn't get fully combusted on the inside. So maybe I didn't give it enough time. Um, maybe I just didn't manage the oxygen well enough, but yes, you can take that stuff out. The stuff that is crumbly or, uh, it's actually almost sounds metallic when you crinkle it in your hands. Uh, you can crush that stuff up. Uh, absolutely. I have a, like a concrete, like one of those square things on the, that's really heavy and you kind of, uh, it's not, it's not for concrete. It's for, uh, like great, like grading. If you were to take like pound sand down to, in order to put pavers down, um, I use that for, for the stuff that I could. Could break up and that works really well well there um carmen um sheila was talking about she has put wood ash near a near a fig tree and it the the, the when the rain comes it washes it it washes that ash down by that tree and she says that tree produces more figs than any other fig tree she has what's interesting about this is you know that ash should raise the ph of the soil and depending on what fig trees need specifically that that increase in ph may make certain nutrients more available to that tree uh, specifically what the fig tree needs so each you know each tree is is each plant is different um it'd be interesting to see what fig trees actually respond best to and see how an increase in ph might uh might help them there um let's see here <laughs> 
James, James uh, is asking his worm castings have a lot of seeds that are sprouting. <laughs> how can they reduce? How can you get? How can you reduce that? Um, James, you, I mean, first of all, it means you've got fertile worm castings. Uh, I would imagine it's, it's, of course, you can germinate any anything that's a decent habitat and, and wet enough. It, what that means, it, I, I would honestly just pull those things out of there and then you can lay them on top of the vermicompost. Um, I guess his worm castings, I'm assuming this is not vermicompost. Um, it, whoever made the, the castings likely did not fully compost the material and thus kill the seeds that would have been in some of the, that's whether it's weeds or whether it's other plants. Um, I know I've, depending on the time of year, I'll have like pumpkin seeds sprouting in my urban worm bag just because it's a fertile environment and I didn't compost the seeds before I put them in there. So I don't know how you reduce it once you've got the castings. It's really more a function of the, um, it's, it's really more a function of the, 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 the composting or verm lack of composting actually that happened uh, before the worms were set onto that material to make the worm castings. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, I was just going to jump in real quick. If you mean that it's in your, it, when you say worm castings, if you mean it's in your verma composting system, you could, you could, Steve didn't really mention this, but you could pre compost where you're putting things through the thermophilic phase to kill seeds and pathogens and then feed it to your worms otherwise mm -hmm. yeah just like he said if things are popping up in your bin just pull them and let them and break down and they're already sprouting so they're not going to sprout in the future yeah um betty asks a very general question that's <laughs> what's a recipe for vermicompost uh recipe for vermicompost is whatever worms are going to be happy eating and then pooping out so it's going to be a mixture of carbon and nitrogen betty what i would do is is you're going to have bedding. You're going to have your carbon-rich bedding material, which are your browns. You're going to have your greens, which are more nitrogen-rich. And you want about double the volume of browns as you have to greens for what your worms are going to eat. I mean, there's so many different ways you can go with how to make a kind of a quote-unquote recipe for vermicompost. Some people use manures, uh, pre-composted manures typically. A lot of people are using food waste. A lot of people are just using whatever organic waste that they have around the, the house that comes from basically plants. Um, Gail, gay Gail is asking, I'm getting worm balls one to two per month. Please address or please advise. Worm balls are kind of a cluster of worms that can happen for a good reason or a bad reason. Uh, worms may be swarming, uh, some really rich organic matter that you have in your worm bin. That would sort of be kind of a good thing. Uh, they also may be clustering together in really um poor conditions for the worms and that's them when they cluster together like that that's a sign of stress and a size sign of they they might be dying um or they are just they're again just stressed i there's it can happen for good or bad i would it's tough to know without knowing more about your worm bin uh they're gay um let's see here uh got anything else here troy i got uh Let's see here. <laughs> and Duro says, Betty, you just opened up a whole can of worms. That's that's true. Um, let's see here. Uh, and Duro asked again, I add, uh, they have a leaf pile. One's eight years old. The other side's new. Should I start on the side that's old? Yeah, I would use the oldest leaves that are going to be broken down the most. Um, anytime you're trying to feed worms or make a soil mix, always use the oldest stuff that's broken down or i couldn't think of any time that you wouldn't want to use the oldest stuff first mm -hmm. betty asked a follow-up question what's the difference between worm castings and vermicompost so worm castings betty are specifically worm poop worm manure uh vermicompost would be that worm poop with other let's just call it undigested organic matter at some point, that vermicompost, when worked through well enough by the worms, becomes worm castings. It's sort of, if you think of a spectrum, where you've got worms and stuff that you recognize as not worms, whether it's yesterday's mail and yesterday's food waste, that's vermicompost. But it's slowly being made into worm castings. And so the worm castings are the worm poop fraction of vermicompost. But if you let worms completely finish whatever it is that they're, that they're eating in a, in a, in a worm bin, especially like a batch method style worm bin, like a five gallon bucket, 
eventually you're going to be able to call that stuff just worm castings. Now it's going to be worm castings with worms in it <laughs> probably, but once all that food is worked through, you can call it worm casting. So it's a, it's a, it's a semantic question or answer a little bit. Um, but I think that, and, and again, you can never have pure worm castings unless you can put a bag around the butt of every single worm that you have <laughs> in your worm bin and that's not going to happen. So, um, that's that's another marketing ploy. People talk about pure worm castings. There's really no, no such thing as pure worm castings. We just don't have the filtration and, and screening available to do that. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's that's another very very common very common question. The more it looks homogenous and the, the almost all the same, which is typically going to be a, a very dark brown, maybe even blackish material, that is going to be pretty much your worm castings. Uh, Anyway, um, Sheila says her worm bins are looking better and producing better than they have in three years and gives us a thanks. Thank you so much, Sheila, for that. Appreciate the, uh, appreciate the shout out. Um, let's see here. That's about all the Brad, questions. Yeah. Brad offers right. something about, um, Ooh, let's see. The, the, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll cover this one. Brad o talks about biochar. He uses an open cone cone like pit for his making biochar. Um, you just have to have different sized wood to keep, uh, to keep feeding it. Then he says, I put some clay in a bucket with rainwater and urine as a slurry in order to extinguish it. I'm curious what the urine does there, uh, but maybe add some uh, urea, nitrogen possibly uh, to the mix, um, maybe as a way of charging, uh, not charging, but yeah, charging the the biochar I've, I've never heard of that but that would be an interesting way to charge biochar with 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 urine <laughs> so uh yeah um cool I, well i guys i think that wraps it up and and we're coming up on 50 minutes from from right now um and uh yeah this was a, this was another good one just got about 200 viewers again i think we've been stuck at 99 for a while so call your mom uh see if she'll she'll get on real quick so we can get to 100 again um yeah. But uh, appreciate appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, some things I've talked about in the last couple of weeks are going to continue. Uh, I'll have some more updates on the new cover coming out for the Urban Worm Bag, uh, the new designs that we're going to have, which are, I'm really excited about. We're going to start selling those probably within a month. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions this time of year about bulk worm castings, and there were a couple couple questions that people had, and I want to cover that real fast. I meant to cover it in the beginning. Um, we offer anywhere from a thousand pounds so we we sell worm castings at two pounds and ten pounds and beyond but we also sell uh worm castings delivered in super sacks anywhere from a thousand pounds up to a full truckload if you need it i get two main questions how does the basically how does the shipping work on stuff on stuff like that and can i bag it and resell it and i'm going to answer the second question first yes you can do whatever you want with these worm castings you can bag it resell it under your own name we are perfectly fine with you doing that um the other thing is how the freight works. Typically, uh, these things are uh, not typically, they will be shipped via a uh, semi-truck. Um, and when you check out, uh, you can buy this product online and our prices include shipping. It includes freight anywhere in the lower 48. Um, what it does not include is a lift gate charge. So you would have to check out with a lift gate uh, uh, kind of upcharge on the website unless you have a forklift, a big skid steer with forks, or you have a commercial loading dock, which most people, most people honestly don't have any of those. So um, it makes the shipping a lot cheaper uh, for you if you can have this delivered to a place that has uh, commercial uh, commercial offloading uh, capabilities like a commercial loading dock. I really meant to answer that stuff in the beginning, but I think we will probably do something on, on reselling worm castings. I know there are a lot of business curious people on here um, long story short is buying worm castings at bulk and then reselling them is a fairly easy, fairly easy way to triple your money in terms of revenue. Your cost of goods is a dollar. You should be able to get $3, uh, back, uh, or at least two extra dollars back. So triple, triple your, uh, triple your, your money. Um, it's just, it's one of the things this time of year, that's one of those easy things for a small a small business to do. So we may do a, uh, we may do a segment on that as well. Um, so anyway, um, cool. Troy, do you have anything, uh, what you want to cover again real quickly, what you're going to talk about next week? And then, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll so, so next week I'm going to go through 
uh, organic forms of different types of fertilizer. So uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, uh, different types of minerals. Um, so it'll be kind of an addition to this week, but also separate. So those are going to be things that you can use in the potting soil that we went through this week, or it's something that you can use completely separate that are amendments for your garden. Uh, but they'll be all organic and all are na all natural. So, uh, and then I was also going to mention someone had brought up the urban worm bag harvest, and I've been wanting to do one of these on harvest your first harvest of an urban worm bag, which we're going to do some point in the future. So, uh, and then Steve mentioned the biochar too. So that that will be next week. I was just going to say in the future we'll we'll touch on those, but next week will be organic forms of nutrients and minerals. Cool. All right. With that, guys, we're going to wrap it up. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Another good turnout and, and more great questions. So um, we'll uh, we'll shut it off here, and we will uh, see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Great. Bye-bye.